I, I can start in a rather inarticulate, incoherent way, and then Simon can tidy up afterwards <laughs> and fill in all the gaps I, 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 I over, overlooked. Um, and the second thing is just looking in the room, I kind of feel like saying, well, why are you asking me? Why don't you tell me what it should be? So I'm, I'm, I'm slightly in awe. Uh, and the, the, the reason why I agreed to be a, a, a patron of, of this and why I'm now to, uh, chair Wilton Park is because basically I came to the conclusion that it would be rather nice to have a foreign policy. Um, and because I had this feeling that for, for, in a sense, for too long, we kind of were becoming incredibly reactive and uh, not just incredibly reactive, that the one area where we withdrew money more and more was actually the Foreign Office itself. And we kind of mistook uh, spending money on DFID and talking about what our defence should be. Uh, we mistook that for having a foreign policy. Now, in the area of intelligence and security, I think uh, you know, there's really good stuff, the National Security Council, all that work is really good, but it is an overall overreaching. I actually think there's only one thing which we need to do, and it's a kind of combination between a doomsday book uh, come, who do we think we are? Uh, because one of the, 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 the areas of, of, of utter uncertainty is, is a, a reflection of that actually I don't think UK PLC has a sense of who it is anymore. And I was struck by this last week when I went to Germany, and I did an event in North, North Germany, and uh, I sort of, as an example, said to them, look, you guys, you keep telling me that I've just come from England, and actually you mean the United Kingdom. And it sort of uses one phrase as, as, as all these islands, but it's England. But for the Germans, they, they have made a, a very big journey where European interests and German interests are actually absolutely the same. They kind of look at you slightly puzzled when you say yes, but you know, and Germany equals Europe for them. Uh, but that kind of gives them a way of, of looking at the world. And I've just thought of looking at three areas where that need to, to define who we are and what we think is important. Only after we've done that does it allow us to project what the foreign policy should be. And let's just start off with China. Uh, I think unless we have a sense of what we think, uh, what our universities are for, unless we have a sense of what we think our trade future is in terms of is it in producing goods, is it in producing services, is it in protecting intellectual uh, 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 you know, property, uh, I don't think we can work out what our relationship with China should be and how we define it. Uh, because at the moment we're faced with someone exceptionally large who operates on a extraordinary long-term view who actually does what they say they're going to do and, and in a sense we keep being surprised that oh my god they're actually doing what they said they were going to do uh, and you know I look at some of our universities and postgraduate courses <coughs> And when I see that 72% Chinese student in a postgraduate course at a particular university, I'm sorry, that is, apart from anything else, that is not a sustainable business mo model, given that you, you, you could change so quickly. The second one is, if I look at uh, our, one, one of the big things which we are good at is the power to convene. And I think probably one of the, the most remarkable things was uh, after the Skripal attack in Salisbury. Uh, I think the, the UK's power to convene and reach a consensus <coughs> for what was quite, you know, targeted and, and, and sophisticated action was, was was quite extraordinary. But I think it was kind of one off. And in order, if we want to use the power to convene uh, and the reach, we have to have an understanding of, you know, who do we think is friend, who do we think is foe, and who do we think is someone we need to work with because we've got no other choice other than just continuously reacting to uh, events. And one of the areas of where uh, reacting mm -hmm. to events and not taking a proper look, not taking a look of allowing other people to hold up a mirror, I think is an area of the Commonwealth. Uh, you know, and, unless we allow sort of the under 35s uh, here and in the Commonwealth to define what they think the Commonwealth should deliver, we're never going to have that proper reach other than one which is nostalgic, backward looking and doesn't get us anywhere. So it requires those, those, those new definitions. And now that takes me to the third thing, which is absolutely essential. Uh, and that is, you know, at, at some stage people are looking at party manifestos and what it says about our defence capability. And you turn on the news today uh, about saying, you know, 800 British soldiers stationed in the Baltics will be overrun by the Russians. And I felt like saying, is that really a news headline? I mean, 
I think I've probably worked that one out without a repeat, uh, but that was going to happen. But there has to be some raison d'etre as to why you have them there. What is a part of a bigger picture? And what does it coherently deliver? And I, so I'm look, desperately looking forward for a strategic defense review, which actually starts with a statement which says we are aligned. Uh, and that then has consequences for trading the Navy and everything else. <coughs> Do we think there's a threat from there? And then are we really going to send our troops abroad? And all that then has to come in. So uh, it's a rather long-winded way of saying that unless we start to have a good look at ourselves, who we are, and what we want to happen, uh, a foreign policy is almost impossible. Uh, but having one, we need to. Brilliant. But Yoda would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Gisela. Simon. Right, thank you very much. Well, first of all, I mean, thank you very much for inviting us. I just want to say I'm very supportive of VFPG. <coughs> and it's great that Sophia is joining. The fact that you fill this room and you're filling rooms at other events is fantastic because it shows that there's interest in this issue. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. And there's a lot to do. We were asked to say three things about uh, what we thought the three priorities were for British foreign policy. And indeed, I think Gisela and I share, although we come from different positions on the key issue of the day, uh, which is probably why we've been selected to be the uh, <laughs> presidents of this group, we come from different positions on Brexit, but I think we've got a lot of common ground in our view on foreign policy. I'm going to start by referring you to this article in the FT today that some of you I know have seen, which says the UK falls in diplomatic rankings despite global Britain vision. This is the Lowry Institute, the equivalent of Chatham House, roughly, in, um, or, or Rusi in Australia, who do a survey which shows that in terms of our diplomatic network and our foreign policy influence, we are out of the top 10, they claim, internationally. I just refer to that. I don't, wouldn't say I necessarily agree to it, but it's indicative of a sort of theme, which is what we're addressing, which is where does Britain stand, what is our influence in the world, and how are we going to exercise it? And my three things would be the following in, in addressing that. First of all, we need to understand the world that we live in and how it's changing. Uh, we are going through profound change. This is a, a moment of extraordinary strategic uncertainty in the world. Um, it is, I, mean, I describe this as the start of the, of the 21st century, the geopolitical 21st century, <laughs> which sort of began, we saw it beginning to take shape with the end of um, the support for the liberal democrat, liberal openness and democracy of the post-Cold War period and the erosion of support for globalization in our societies. Uh, and we are only beginning to see that uh, beginning to form 2008, the financial crisis, 2016, Brexit and Trump, 2017, the shift in Chinese foreign policy uh, as set out in President Xi's uh, speeches. These are big things that we need to understand. And essentially, I believe we are entering a, bi a new bipolar era in geopolitics, which is the United States and China as by far the preeminent powers in the world. And therefore, our task is to understand how we fit into that new world, uh, how we manage that, potent that confrontation and potential conflict between those two powers, uh, and how we, uh, working with others, can adapt to this new set of uh, circumstances. And we have to, that's geopolitics, we have to layer onto that all the other change that we talk about all the time around technology, demography, and of course the environment, which are posing huge international challenges. So in a nutshell, that's the sort of landscape. And I think the challenge for us is to have the imagination to understand how things are going to evolve. And I would say we've failed in imagination, frankly, in recent years, particularly in relation to China and understanding the speed and impact of the growth of Chinese power. We thought that China would comfortably fit into essentially a system designed by us in our own interests. And of course, that ain't going to be the way it is. So we've got to think out of the box about that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, once you've understood a bit about the context, and I think this is what Gisela was saying, you know, to take the old Greek maxim, know thyself. So we need to understand you know, where we stand in the international system, what our national interests are, what our capabilities are, and what our role should be uh, in the post-Brexit world. Uh, we are a country of significant international and diplomatic assets. There's no, you know, that is a fact, whether it is our hard power assets, military intelligence, our traditional diplomatic assets, 
or our broad range of soft power assets, which is something that BFEG have been focusing on a lot. You know, of course, we have those assets, but essentially we are an influential upper medium power in the world. Uh, and if we're outside the EU, we stand alone uh, in that, or we stand more alone in that uh, status. Um, our interest, I believe, does lie in maintaining a law-based international system based in agreements and negotiations and compromises that serve the collective good. I'm not sure that that's entirely the mindset of some people who support Brexit, but I believe it's where our interests lie. Um, and, um, uh, of course, behind all that lies the supreme interest of helping to avoid major great power conflict in the period ahead. Um, so all those things should be underlying our foreign policy and our understanding of our place in the world. Uh, and behind all that lies our strong interest in preserving open, liberal societies, the societies that we've spent so much effort building, which I believe are still the best societies in the world, and which we need to defend. So that's a bit about knowing ourselves and our interests. And that only when you've done that can you actually prescribe your foreign policy uh, goals. And we need to think very clearly about where our national interests lie. Uh, I, I believe that foreign policy has to be thought through in terms of national interest, because that's the way the world's organized. And therefore, we need to think, what are our security interests? What are our prosperity interests? And the third thing which we need to do in our foreign policy is to look after British people around the world and help facilitate their activity in the world. Um, I, personally, I wouldn't have started from here in terms of having all the things I've talked about. I wouldn't leave the EU. I don't think that's a good place to start this adventure, but if that's what we're going to do, uh, then we need to think all the more hard about what the objectives are and what we can actually do. And we need to think about what relationships we need in the world. So which are the relationships that matter most to us? I would argue with the other democracies of Europe and North America, the Commonwealth, Japan and others. Uh, we need to work out how we're going to influence those relationships and leverage them. We need to work out how we're going to operate in international organisations as a country outside the EU, what leverage will we have, how can we maximise our influence there. And we need, I think, and this comes to use this convening point, to be creative about how we're going to adapt to change and whether this country can find a sort of nimble, agile convening role in the international system that will be a different, bit different from what we've had before. And I think a big test of this will be the big climate change conference in Glasgow at the end of next year, which I expect to be the primary focus of our foreign policy activity in many ways over the year ahead, and will be the sort of testing ground for post-Brexit Britain in the international arena in many ways. Very interesting opportunity and challenge. Um, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. The only thing I'd say finally is, once you've understood that, you need to be able to marshal your domestic policy and your resources, your national resources, in order to be effective in pursuing your goals. And at the moment, I think we'll come on to this, but at the moment I would argue <coughs> the funding of international policy in the UK is a bit too atomised in Whitehall. There are too many centres of responsibility, and I agree with Jeep Giesler, therefore, no real sense of national strategy that's driving or being driven by the central machine. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Simon.